that's rough. <laughs> Maybe. Well, hi guys, welcome to Bible study. It's so good to see you guys all here tonight. We're gonna start with some worship, so let's go ahead and stand and we're gonna sing together. God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He's 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, and who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Uh, tonight for our prayer time, do something just a little bit different. Um, we'll do some guided prayer, but I'm going to take our prayer list and I'm going to kind of group our, our people kind of in some like needs, some, you know, just some folks who have cancer or folks who have some basic health needs and those who are grieving the loss, those who are 
who are facing uh, death and uh, seems to be imminent and a few other things in here. And so as I kind of mention these and pray for these, I'm going I'm to switch off my mic and uh, I'm going to ask you just to, where you're at, just pray out loud. That's totally uncomfortable for you. That's okay. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to be loud, but just, just speak to the Lord on behalf, intercede for these people, and, uh, and just that we might even be able to hear the prayers of those around us as we all kind of collectively intercede together. So again, if that's super uncomfortable for you, that's okay. Um, but if you're willing to do that, just that, uh, yeah, we'll just pray out loud. So we'll begin with um, coming up, uh, I believe they're leaving maybe this Saturday. Do you know when they're leaving the India mission trip? Uh, Friday, maybe? So we, anyway, this weekend, we have 15 people that are heading out um, to uh, India where they will be doing some mission work out there. So let's pause and just pray for that trip. Next, we've got several people who are just battling some different uh, various health issues, some, some minor, some major, but uh, Eva Lott has an upper respiratory infection. Uh, John Rush is still in isolation at, at Resolute. Um, Betty Wilson is at Eden Home for, for rehab. Um, William's family, their son Jackson, he's still in, he's obviously in the hospital for treatment on his various kind of uh, mental and various issues that he has there. Jim Weston's mom is in rehab with lots of health issues. And uh, Lisa Reed at home recovering, I believe from surgery, and, and Morris McEwen just has some health concerns. So let's just pause and pray for all these different health needs here. We also have many that are battling specifically cancer. Just kind of putting that off the side because that's so, so common and, and so, uh, so difficult to fight and battle and take so many lives. So let's pray for Janice Janes, uh, for Pete Bassett, for Beth Lane, for Honey Herring, for Kevin Jonas. Pray for Nolan Cernasek as they all battle cancer. Let's pray for uh, the Garza family. Armando's father passed away, Armando uh, Sr., and as well as the, uh, the Boley family and the passing of, of John Boley as they just grieve those losses.
then we've got um, a few that are just kind of facing down their their uh, last last days. It would seem Daniel Jennings' sister uh, seems to be in her final days. Geraldine Lott, she's on hospice care, but had been there for a while, and and then especially and we pray a lot for uh, Jason Frederick, who uh, has been battling cancer, uh, just a couple years older than I am, and. Uh, they sent him home from MD Anderson, saying there's nothing more that they can do um, for him. So just pray for him and, and that young family. And then uh, finally, uh, let's pray for the Harris family as they continue to look for their missing son, Caleb. Father, we give you praise and glory. You are the God who hears our prayers. So, Father, we lift these all up to you, trusting that we have your ear tonight. May you be honored as we continue to offer you praise and song and worship of your word, worship and fellowship. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. As we sing this song called No Longer Slaves and coming out of this time of prayer, I'm just reminded how much, uh, how heavy this world can be and the physical ailments that we endure and the loss and the grieving. And uh, while the chorus of this song says, I'm no longer a slave to fear, fear can come in many ways. And so let's, let's kind of meditate on this thought as we sing the song that our hope does not rest here in this world with all the troubles of this world, but we have that hope in our eternal Father. And so we, we truly have nothing to be afraid of here in this place.
Well, before we jump in tonight, give you all a little uh, schedule outlook for the rest of our uh, semester on our Wednesday night stuff. So tonight we will wrap up um, First John, and then uh, tomorrow night, um, Pastor Ray will be back, and he's going to cover Second John. Uh, then I'll do Third John, and then we will um, cover the Book of Jude in a couple a couple weeks. Y'all don't often get teachings from Second and Third John and Jude, but. You guys are special, so we're going to make sure you all get all the good books. Uh, and then that'll be our last time. So that'll be, uh, I think, May 15th will be our last Wednesday night meeting. And then that next week will be kind of our last uh, Wednesday night of church stuff because we'll have our WANA closing ceremonies and all that, but we won't have our uh, Bible study on that week. So uh, we've got a lot to cover, so we're going to jump in tonight. So we are covering just really the last four verses is all that remains here um, for First John, but, uh, but John has packed it in, so we've got a lot to talk about. So we're just going to kind of take these a, a verse or half a verse at a time as we kind of, kind of go through this. So we'll begin here where, uh, where John starts, and he says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Now this is something we've already talked about through this series because John has already talked about that. Um, and, and the NIV, I think, does a good job putting in and this phrase in here as continue to sin. Because we can oftentimes kind of read this or think that means, hey, if I sin, I guess, does that mean, John, you saying I'm not a Christian? No, the idea is continue to sin. And that doesn't mean just like, well, I sinned yesterday and I, I sinned today and, and I'm going to definitely sin again next week. Is that not continuing? No, the idea is that it's this habitual, this purposeful, this continual practice of sin. It's really this idea of what we just sang about of being slaves, not simply to fear, but being slaves to sin. That is your master. That is what happens to those who are not born of God. But we who are born of God, um, we might fail, um, but we will continue to fight. We might, um, you know, we might uh, uh, give in, but we won't give up. We might... uh, uh, rebel, but we won't. Re- but we will repent. There's the, there is failure, and there is a mistake. There is sin that occurs, but it is is repentance. It is getting back. It is fighting again. My uh, second oldest daughter is in track, and so I've been going to a lot of track meets lately. And they're in districts right now. Last night she uh, she runs kind of more long distance stuff. So last night was a mile and a half, the 2400 meter. Tonight she's uh, actually after I get done preaching here, we'll I'll head over to the to the uh, track and uh, watch her run the mile later on tonight. And so I was watching this race, these long races, that six laps around the track for the 2400. And, you know, you're about, you know, 50 meters into the race, and you can already tell who's going to win it. You can already see this girl who's just taken off, and she's got a good stride. You know, she's pumping it. You know, she looks, she looks good. You're like, okay, she's going to hold on. And sure enough, you know, she, she goes through it. There's other girls who are keeping a pretty steady pace. That's kind of my daughter, you know. She's kind of just got, you know, she's in one gear and just keeps it the whole way, you know, and finishes in the middle of the pack. There's this one girl, though, that I watch, and she started out pretty strong and and kind of based on where she, her starting position is like, man, she's, she's really pushing it. She's getting out there. Well, about somewhere in that third lap, I mean, it's just like she just dropped it down into first gear, like something happened. And all of a sudden, she just went and started shuffling down, you know, the track like she was, uh, you know, 90 years old or something. Uh, I don't know if she got hurt, got a stitch in her side or something. But as she came around the near side of the track, I mean, you could just see on her face just agony. Like she was in some serious pain. And she's just, you know, just trying, I mean, like about like that. And, uh, and she's going for another three laps. And you're just going, oh, you know, and everybody's you know, cheering for her because she's getting lapped, you know, and she finally comes in and finishes. 
And, and I think that's a lot like us as Christians. Like there are some of us that, man, we're out there and we're just killing it. Man, we're, we're, we're the pace setters. We're doing a great job. We're running the race. You know, we might not get our, our perfect time. We might stumble, but we're, we're leading the pack. And, and there's a lot of people who are just, you know, just kind of steady Eddie, just kind of, kind of running it, doing well. But, man, there's a lot of us that are like that girl where something happens and we are just struggling through life. And it is difficult. And sin is, is wearing us down and we are fighting, but we're fighting it. And we keep running that race. And we cross that finish line. We fight the good fight. We finish the race, Paul says. That's what a Christian does. That's what people who are born of God, people who are not born of God, they give in. They are slaves to sin. That is what defines their life. That is the the trajectory of their life. Romans 6, 6, Paul says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And that's what John's talking about here. Those who are born of God do not continue to sin because we are no longer slaves to sin. The second half of that verse 18, he says, The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Now, the, the NIV translation is not, not, doesn't capture the idea real well, and frankly, there's not a lot of translations that do that really well because it kind of sounds like the same person. We just said anyone born of God, that's talking about us, but now it says the one who is born of God keeps him safe. Well, if you, have, you really have to kind of go behind the, the background and look at the, the grammar and the Greek and all this, it's way too smart for me and I have to trust commentators, but the one here that is born of God that, that John's now talking about, that's Christ. He is the one, the, the begotten of God, the one that by the Holy Spirit conceived in Mary was, was born of God. This is who is the one who keeps us safe. He is the one that keeps us from harm. And so it says here that he keeps us safe and the evil one cannot harm them, cannot harm us, those who are born of God. And this word harm it, it means really to, some of, some of your versions might say it cannot lay hold of him. And so it does have this idea of someone who will, who will grab, who will lay hold of someone to do some harm to them, to do damage to them, to treat them in a violent manner. And so you read that and you go, well, so what's John saying here? Is he saying that, that for Christians, for those born of God, that nothing bad will ever happen to us? Well, surely not. I mean, we, we can read through the Bible and, and see that pretty quickly. And we can see the stories of people who have their faith in God and lots of harm um, befall them. And not only just harm, but harm that is directly done by the evil one. Job, Satan comes before God and gets permission to do these things. David is incited by Satan to take this census to bolster up his pride about the size of his army. We see these things that are work. We see Jesus pray for Peter, who Satan came to him and said, I want to sift Peter like wheat. But Jesus prayed for him that that uh, he might, when he, he, when he uh, rises up, that he might rally his brothers. And so we go, that, that's not true. And we look around the world, just look at the headlines, we can see believers in our lives, people that we know, people we don't know, we just hear about across the globe that suffer a great amount of harm. And so that's surely not what John is talking about here. And so this really can only mean this idea of this permanent harm to our eternal life that John has been talking about throughout this letter. He's been telling us that I'm writing you these things that you might know you have confidence that you have eternal life. And so here he says you can have confidence because the evil one can do nothing to that. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of his hand, out of my father's hand, and I and my father are one. So John tells us, and Satan, the evil one, cannot take us out of Christ's hands. Jesus says that you're in my hands, you're also in the father's hands. You've got this double grip security that God has taken care of you, and he's not going to release us. Now, there's there's certainly arguments out there that, well, maybe we can take ourselves out of the very grip of God ourselves by renouncing our faith, you know, apostasy. We talked a little bit of that last week. Well, Scripture, while it, it, it gives some reason to maybe think that and gives some ideas that, that stirs that imagination up, it's still not really that clear. And so what John tells us is, hey, you need to, to trust God, trust that he has you, trust that no harm can befall you. But at the same time, he says, but don't be lazy in your faith. Don't continue in sin. That's not who you are. 
And you are called to follow wholeheartedly after Jesus. And so do that. Don't rest on this. Don't rest on the idea of security in the sense of not going to, to live out and, and, and play out your salvation. No, trust in God's care for you and then live and follow after him. Next at verse 19, John says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, you might be thinking, now wait a minute, didn't Jesus say something after his resurrection like all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me? Well, you'd be right, he did. He said that, Matthew 28. After his resurrection, he's talking to the disciples sometime before his ascension. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. God is sovereign. All authority is Jesus. Then how is it that Satan has control over this world? I want to read to you a passage from Revelation 20. Now, as we read this, I, I, don't want you to get, I don't want you to get lost in, you know, thinking on, uh, on what this means for some future event and the timing of things or, or whether this is figurative or literal or, or any of that. That's not the reason I want to bring this passage up. I want you to, to think about what the relationship is between God and Satan. I want you to see what the power dynamics are between God and Satan in here. So this is in Revelation uh, 20, and we'll read it. A few different verses here, and it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And then skipping down, says, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Now, again, think about this power relationship between God and Satan. Here's the scene. God is this is vision that John uh, is having, and God's there on his throne and the, the council of the, the elders, and, and all of a sudden God's like, you know, it's like, hey, who's that angel in the corner? I don't know his name. Hey, hey, you, can you come over here? This unimportant angel doesn't even have a name in Scripture. Just come on over here. Can you grab that chain and just go ahead and take the trash out for me? Come and bind Satan and go throw him in to the abyss and just let him stew there for, oh, let's say about a thousand years. And then he can come out and he can do some stuff, but then we'll, we'll put an end to that as well. We'll finish him off in the lake of fire. There is no idea like this yin and yang where it's this, you know, equal amounts of good and evil and this eternal conflict that neither one can overcome the other. That is not the case. God is completely and totally sovereign over Satan. There is no great battle. It is always just right under God's thumb. And so God is sovereign. Jesus is in authority, but yet God, for his divine purposes, allows Satan to have control in the world. And that's not just simply in this idea of the planet. This is those who, who are slaves to sin, those who have submitted themselves to the control although unwittingly under the control of the evil one. And notice, notice so let's just kind of rabbit trail here for a second. Notice what the, the true power of Satan is. It's, it's his tongue. It's what he says. Here in Revelation, it talks about him deceiving the nations, speaking these lies. Jesus says about him that he is the father of lies. When he, when he speaks lies, he is speaking his native tongue, that is what he does. He demonstrates his, his power through words, thoughts, ideologies, beliefs that become implanted in the minds of people who are under the power and control of the world of the evil one. People who are not born of God, they accept these words. I don't know where they're coming from. We, we can see this in, in so many places throughout Scripture where these types of things have occurred. And they just can't see... Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And just like there, you know, in, uh, in Proverbs, the different authors there, Solomon in particular, will talk about this, he kind of personifies this uh, adulterous woman or this, this or folly that's like this unruly woman that calls to people, speaks and calls out to people in the street, wayward fools, to pull them in to something that they think will fulfill 
their desires, will give them everything they want, some lie that they will buy. But what they don't realize is that her house is the gateway to death. And this is the same as it is for the evil one. Proverbs 7, 27, her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. 9, 18, but little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. This is where the lies, the control of Satan, where it leads people. That's why the world, what's the result of the world being under the control of the evil one. Now, and Satan can certainly affect physical things. Again, we see that in the, the story of Job, where he, you know, bulls on, on Job and his, his family are, are killed, his sons and daughters, his servants, his material possessions are taken away. He can certainly have that effect, or, or, but, we, but we see his real power in the power of the tongue. Adam and Eve in the garden, they're deceived that the truth is twisted upon them. We see it in Jesus and his temptations. He's, he's using words to try to draw us away and try to tell us there's a better way through temptations. As we talked about David earlier in the census, he instills error in people. And so we can see this all over the place today. And I just spent a little time just trying to think of what are some of the, these, these deep-rooted ideas, these things that you hear, these things that you read, even in our modern context today, that seem good. Because that's one of the, one of the specialties of Satan, that he just likes to to twist that truth, to take it and just manipulate it enough where it sounds right, but it is extreme error. Here's a few of the things that, that I wrote down, some of the current lies being spoken by the evil one to the world that is under his control. Love, love means letting people do whatever they want. You're going to tell somebody, you can't tell somebody that they're, they're wrong. That's who they are, that's who they say they are. Love is just letting them be. Or maybe... Someone else is responsible for my current situation. A victim mentality. My choices, the things, the, the sins that I've done, that has nothing to do with it. Somebody else has power over me and they are to blame. I'm not responsible for anything bad in my life. How about money will solve all our problems? Well, that's an old lie. I guess that must be a really good one because he keeps playing that record over and over again throughout the centuries. My child's success is more important than them following Jesus or me following him. Suffering and hardship should be avoided at all costs. There is nothing good that comes from those things. We've got to prevent them and eliminate them from our lives. My life, it's all about me. It's my life. I should do whatever makes me happy, whatever's good for me. What I, I get out of church is what is most important. I'll have time later to get serious about my faith. And one more, it's just a little sin. It's not a big deal. Now, y'all could probably add another 20, 30, 100 to that list if we all sat around and thought about the little half-truths that, that are deeply implanted in the minds of people that we see. But those of us who've who've been born of God, we have been freed from the control of the evil one. We are no longer slaves to sin. However, like a, like a spy, like an infiltrator that, that slips behind enemy lines and all of a sudden becomes a part of the army, all of a sudden finds himself in a position of, of being able to give counsel, to be able to give wisdom and, and being able to tell about what the other side is doing simply to manipulate and to, and to let information come out to the other side. Like that happens. We allow these ideas of the enemy to slip behind our defenses of our own minds and to take root into our minds. And John tells us here in the, next, in the following verse, verse 20, he says, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, that we might have understanding and be able to take captive these rogue ideas, these malicious ideologies, these thoughts, and make them obedient to Christ. Paul tells in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow or deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. 
So John even points to this truth here, like we've been given understanding because we are born of God, and so we have got to be able to root out the evil one and the way he tries to control the world. We cannot let him control us with those same powerful spoken lies. But we have to take those thoughts and we have to make them obedient to Christ, like giving them a bath, like washing them and going, let's, what's the truth here? Let's remove what is twisted and let's bring out what is true. And so let's just think about those ones that I've already said. Instead of love means letting people do whatever they want, really, no, we talked about it already. Love is not defined by what we do. It's defined by what Christ has done. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And so when we love people, we're going to tell them the truth in a kind and gracious way, but because we know the truth will set them free because they're walking on the path to destruction of, of whatever they are doing in their life, wherever they are lost, and it is leading them down to the gates of hell. Like the adulterous woman's house, it leads them down to where the dead are. And so love is going to call them out of that. When someone says, like, I'm not responsible for anything that's happened in my life, everyone has done this to me, no, we go, I am responsible. Yes, external things can happen in my life that are out of my control, but I also have a lot of self-inflicted wounds, choices and decisions that I've made that have brought about the consequences of my life, and it's time for me to take ownership over those things. Money, it won't buy me happiness. It won't solve all of my problems. It is a wonderful resource, but it, the love of it is the root of many kinds of evil. And so we have to learn that money is not our savior, Jesus is our only savior. Is success the best thing that we can give our kids to make sure they can make every sports team and never miss anything that, that, that trumps everything in our life or their education is what's going to set the tone for their future? Those are good things. But they are not better things than modeling and teaching them how to follow Jesus. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is what is most important. Suffering, hardship, they're hard. They stink, but they are good. They develop character, perseverance, hope. These things are creating us when we walk through those things with Christ at our side. When we participate in the sufferings of Christ, that is actually a privilege and a blessing that we are granted. Is my life really all about me? No, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so I am a servant to my master. My life is for him to be used as he sees fit, and I trust him that he will use it well. Is what is most important about church what I can get out of it? That consumeristic mindset? No. No, I am a member of the body of Christ. I have been gifted, I have been equipped to be able to build others up. How can I be an effective part of the body of Christ and so that I can serve and, and care for others? That's what I'm a part of. Am I going to live forever? I could put, put these things off down the road? No, no. We prayed for a lot of people already tonight. And that is definitely not true of. God could call us home tonight. And, and lastly, it's just a little sin. It doesn't really matter. Well, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Catch for us the little foxes that get in the vineyard that multiply and get bigger and grow. The, the seed of sin is just important as the fruit of sin. We have to deal with those things. We have to take captive these things that come to us and make them obedient to Christ. In the second half of verse 20, John says, And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Eugene Peterson has this great quote. He says, All the water and all the oceans cannot sink a ship unless it gets inside. Nor can all the trouble in the world harm us unless it gets within us. John tells us here, this idea of eternal life again, is that we are safe in Jesus, like Noah in the ark. The, the entire world literally is covered in water, and yet that boat did not sink. That ark remained afloat because it was safe, it was secure. And that is Christ. While the world goes to hell in a handbasket, while the evil one has control over it. And we are safe in Jesus. It reminds me of the you know, wonderful, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it there in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, where Paul talks about you know, who can condemn us. What can we fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? Shall 
trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Shall life or death, angels or demons, height or depth, or the present, the future, nor powers, nor heights or death, or anything else in all of creation separate us from the love of God and that is in Christ Jesus? No, because we remain safe in him, the true God and eternal life. And then finally, here in verse 21, John talks about idols, which feels a little bit, when you read it, you're kind of like, it's like, he's like, oh yeah, one more thing. You know, keep yourselves, you know, from idols. If you read through um, the book of, of Kings, Kings 1 and Kings 2, you know, one of the things you'll notice, and this will happen for, for both sets, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, you'll get these refrains in, in this kind of real brief snapshot of whether they're a good king or, or an evil king. And so uh, just for the quick history lesson, you know, you got Saul and the kingdom passes uh, to David and then David to Solomon. And after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam comes to power. But Solomon had been pretty heavy, pretty tax burden heavy on the people. And so they come, petition Rehoboam. And Rehoboam's like, no, he take, listens to some bad counselors. And he says, I ain't changing a thing. Actually, I'm going to make it even harder on you. And so all the people revolt. And so the kingdom splits. And so it becomes ten tribes of the, called the Northern Kingdom, um, which are just become known as Israel. And then you've got the Southern Kingdoms, which is just known as Judah, and, and actually Benjamin is a part of that as well. And so you've got these ten and two, Israel and Judah. And so a guy named Jeroboam, is a, a prophet tells him God has selected him to, to, to lead this, this new nation of Israel in the north. And so Jeroboam takes over, and one of the very first things that Jeroboam does is that he realizes that, you know what, I'm going to lose all these people because they're going to they're go as they've been commanded to do and go to Jerusalem and worship God in Solomon's temple. And they're going to go and they're going to reclaim affection for Jerusalem, which is there in, Judea, in Judah, in the tribe of Judah's land, and that's where King Rehoboam is, and so I'm going to lose him. So he has this brilliant idea. He makes these two golden calves. He puts one in Bethel and one in Dan, one in the, and one in the south one in the north of, of Israel. And he says, Israel, this is, these are your gods that, that have brought you out of, of Egypt. And so the, the people begin to, to worship them, to prostitute themselves to these gods. And so all the future kings, all the kings in Israel were all evil. There were no good kings that came out of, out of the north. And so I always will say, so-and-so, whatever king this is, and they were this age when they took over, and they ruled for this many years, and they did what was evil, falling in the sins of Jeroboam. Falling in his sins and repeating that. And, and we read these stories and there's all kinds of evil things they did. But we find out in 2 Kings 10 that the, this following in the sin of Jeroboam, the specific sin that he caused the people to commit, was these two idols, these two golden calves. 2 Kings 10, 28, 29. So Jehu, who's the current new king of, of Israel in the north, Destroyed Baal worship in Israel. That's a good thing. That's another one of those gods that's being worshipped. However, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. It was idol worship. Out of all these sins, all the stuff they did, which God was certainly displeased about, but it was his idol worship that God said, this is what stands out to me the most. This is the sin that all these kings are falling in because when their hearts are turned away to worship with other gods, everything else falls apart. We go down to the south and you think about King David. Now, what, what's, the, what's the moniker that Scripture, his most famous moniker that David has? He's a, he's a man after God's own heart, right? Now, think about that. You ever thought about, like, what, what does that mean? Because let's just do a quick little synopsis of the, uh, the darker side of David's life because there's plenty of it, right? He... He sleeps with another man's wife and then devises a conspiracy to cover up. That doesn't work, so then he just kills the guy, takes his wife. Not real good. God confronts him about that through the prophet Nathan, but I wouldn't call that like man after God's own heart activity, right? David was a, a really actually bad father. His oldest son, Amnon, raped his sister, one of David's daughters. David does nothing about it. His other son, Absalom, who's the, the full brother of, of his sister, Tamar, who's been raped, is really upset. And so he goes and kills his brother, his half-brother, Amnon, in vengeance. David does nothing about it. 
His son Absalom comes in, takes over the kingdom. David does nothing about it. David is always just seems to be absent. Actually, even when uh, I think it's Ahijah who was trying to take the throne before Solomon did. And in the text even says, David never talked to him about the, his ways. David never did anything. He wasn't really a very good father at all. He didn't raise very good boys, wasn't really very active in his life. David would not, could not exact justice on the people closest to him. When people would come from afar and say they killed King Saul, he had no problem executing them and taking them out. But when Joab, the commander of his army, when he kills people in cold blood two different times, two very powerful and, and prominent men, David just kind of says, what, what, can I, what am I going to do with you? And then he lets him continue on in his post. The second time he demotes him, and, the guy, and Joab kills the guy who took his spot, and then somehow he ends up back as commander of the armies. David has difficulty executing that justice. We talked about the census that he took, the God that cost thousands of lives of Israelites because David was doing this, which he was warned not to do. And then finally, on his deathbed, as he's telling Solomon to uh, give him words of wisdom to take over the kingdom, the places where he seemed to be really merciful to people like Joab and to people like Shimei who cursed him on his way out of the city when he was fleeing from Absalom, he says, oh yeah, these guys... I want you to make sure that they pay the price and you, get, you kill them. So he tells his son, I want you to take care. All of a sudden, I want to give you this vengeful attitude towards these people. A man after God's own heart. Is that confusing to anyone else? Did anyone else kind of go, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't get that. But yet God continually, and all the kings who would succeed David, I think there were about eight kings who actually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And it always says, as David, their father, did. David becomes the standard for a good king. And now how is that? One thing you will never find in the life of David is David never bows a knee to another God. There are no idols in David's life. There are no idols, at least by, by David's knowledge or David's implement, implement, implementation in the kingdom of Israel. Because David is always, always worships the Lord. He sins. He's like that poor little girl running that long 2,400 meter race. He's coming around at a snail's pace and he is hurting, but he, he's always got his eyes on the right goal, on God. And he repents, but he refuses to worship anybody else. Idol worship is a big deal. When you really think about all those lies that we talked about of the evil one, they're always leading us to, to worship, to sacrifice, to give ourselves to something else. To worship ourselves, to worship money, to worship comfort, to worship others, to worship success, whatever it might be. The devil's, we got to give him his due. He's pretty clever. He knows that we, at least here in the West, we don't fall too easily for wooden statues or, or golden sculptures anymore. But we're pretty open and pretty prey to these types of idols in our lives. And so John tells them, look, and above all else, you've got to be aware of this. You're going to sin in all these other ways, but you cannot give your affection, your worship to another God. Keep yourselves from idols. Worship the one true God, the giver of eternal life, Jesus Christ. And that's his word to his people in this letter. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for First John. We thank you for... Apostle John taking the time to write this letter to a church, to other churches who circulated this, who learned, who, who wisely and by the providence of your spirit kept it for us for all these years that we might read and learn, we might apply, Lord. What well, was written to a people 2,000 years ago in their context, God, there is wisdom, there is truth here for us today. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to rest in your eternal love, your eternal security. But, Father, let us keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep running the race. Not turn aside to some worthless idol. Not buy in to the lies of the enemy who yells from the cheap seats and says, just quit. You've already lost. The race is over. Give up. No, God. Let us take every thought captive. Let us make it obedient to Christ. Let us hear you cheering us on from the sidelines, saying, keep going, keep going. I'm with you. I'm right here with you. Keep going. So, Father, may we be a people 
who are defined, who are known as people who keep going, who follow close to Jesus, who love those around us, who do not give in to the control the enemy has over this world, but we serve the one true God. I pray this in his holy name. Amen. All right. Y'all have a good rest of your night.